All right, so next up we have Adam Mir joining us. And in my ear. Tell us about his role, Kevin. Uh, he plays a very special role. Um, he plays the uncle of Philip, uh, one of the one of Elliot's friends, uh, Mr. Morris Gross. And we shall find out more about his role from the Adam himself. But we'll say he has a very interesting role uh, connected with uh, Elliot's journey, we'll say. Right now. Hello. Hello, Adam. Welcome to the show. Hello, Adam. How are you? Outstanding. Thank you so much for joining us. Kevin Lashford is with us in the studio. Kevin. Hey, Adam. Hey, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, just we are part of the show. And I think, uh, would you like to discuss uh, your uh, character you play in there, uh, Mr. Gross? Yes. Um, well, I was playing um, the uncle of Philip Gross who is actually an ex-Mossad agent uh, that came to the United States to uh, you know, the jewelry. And uh, he's part of the Agoris Cadre. Um, and that's actually pretty interesting that he's uh, dealing with jewelry and he's an Agoris because obviously there's a lot of money in that. And he, you know... Um, they both work with gold. If there's no government involvement, that's always better. Always better. Okay, great. Yeah, so, I mean, so you came up, so you were part of uh, Lady Magdalene's. Uh, yes, that, that was the first thing I did with Neil, and we just got re along really well, and uh, it was really fun to work on. And it, back then, he already told me that he had all these projects in, in, in the works, and he would love me to be part of them. So uh, when Alongside Night came along, uh, he sent me the script and said, I would love you to do that role. And uh, I, will, I, I already said that before we were in the panel in, in, the, in the Hollywood Expo, and I said, Neil, whenever you need me and to do something, I will be there. It's, it's, it's so rare to find a director that, that, is, that is so respectful towards actors and towards everybody that works there that, you know, it's, it's, it's a rarity. Absolutely. So, and how does it feel? I will always do that for for Neil. Absolutely. And how does it feel, kind of, to have several uh, members of the band, you know, kind of the Lady Magdalene's band back together? I mean, Ethan, Susan, um, you know, Mara's Mara Marini's in it. I mean, how does it feel to see the old, the, your old, you know, the crew from Lady Magdalene's again? It's fun. I mean, it's, it's great. I love. That's another thing that I like when 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 a director finds actors that he really likes and he keeps using them. Marcello Mastroianni used to do that. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Fellini used to do that with Marcello Mastroianni, and it's just nice. You know, it's like people get along, they do a good, they get, do good work together, and it's just, it's just nice. It's it's fun. It's always fun to see people you haven't seen for a while, and uh, great. Yeah. I, I love it. Absolutely. Uh, and so in this uh, role, from the, the behind the scenes, uh, you know, what was your favorite moment, uh, you know, acting during this film and or uh, just uh, something funny that uh, happened on the set? I know there is a couple of good stories. Uh, what, what was your favorite moment filming? To tell the truth, my favorite moment was when uh, we started shooting and um, Neil kind of uh, rethought the scene. And he went ahead and said, "You know, you know what? Something is not something is not quite um, connecting between this scene before and the scene after. You guys go ahead and figure it out." Yeah. And he just let us uh, improv uh, a lot uh, at the beginning to figure out what would work and what would help. And that's just really like a pearl for an actor. Yeah. So finally, I... go, go ahead and do whatever you think this character will be like, and. You think that would, you know, it's just add, just add everything that you thought about it, and you're not restricted. So, to tell you the truth, that was my that was my favorite part. I think, and I believe I know the uh, scene you're referencing. I believe it's the dinner scene at the gross residence, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yes, and actually, yes. I have to say, for those of you who have actually read the novel, uh, you're in for a very, very huge surprise uh, for that scene. It's it's amazing how Neil went full circle in that scene and you guys improved probably one of the best 
adaptions. I mean, literally, I believe Neil said, I couldn't have written it any, written it any better myself. I mean, literally wow. bringing it back to the novel. At that's least that's great. what he told me when we were riding uh, back from filming that night. I remember, uh, I remember that scene very well. That's, that's good. I mean, you know, that's what happens when, when the character is well-developed and the story is well-developed and it's well-written, then everybody has the same idea of what's going on, really. Yeah. And it's just easy to be on the same page and just do, just do it. Uh, and yeah, that, I, I guess, I mean, obviously, if, if it would be, if it, if it wasn't so clear what he's trying to do, then it would be a difficult task to, to actually improv that and make it work. And, and especially on that, I mean, on the topic of the novel, I mean, I believe you said you would read it um, sometime before all of us even. I think you'd read it back in when you were working with him on Lady Magdalene's, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you read it. And I think you had some interesting points on it. Uh, would you like to share some of those? Um, well, actually, um, I read m several different um, versions of it. Yes. Um, not not back then, not not back in two thousand six. But I, I read it um, as we went along. He kept he you know, kept sending me the new versions. Yeah. And uh, uh, and it's been a while, so I, I don't remember everything about it. The one thing I remember that the characters kept developing and being more and more uh, full and more uh, you know more understandable and and in a way that probably in a way that. Um, People that are not 100%, they don't know about lib libertarians or agorism. They would uh, they would understand what's going on, and, and that's that's probably what I saw coming along. Yeah, and you said you had, I believe, also read some other agor uh, agorist materials. I think you read some of the uh, some of the stuff from uh, Sam Conkin, actually. Hello, Adam, you still there? Adam, well, it looks like we're losing the connection uh, on his end. Adam. Yes, I'm right here. Okay. I believe you said um, you had also read some of Sam's works, Sam Conkin's works, uh, New Libertarian Manifesto. I think you'd skimmed it. I think you'd spotted, you'd read some of it, I think you said. No, no. I actually just discovered uh, Agorism when, when, when Neil started sending me the scripts. Ah. Uh, I'm not, no, I'm not 100% familiar with Conkin. I mean, I know, and of course, I know who he is now and everything, but I, I, I don't, I didn't read. Okay, well, no, that, no, I understand. No, I believe it was. I, I was referencing uh, several of our contexts. We're in the production suite uh, the night after, I believe we'd. Uh, oh no, it was the night before we went off to shoot at the Gross Residence that day. Uh, those, uh, the exterior and interior shots. Uh, I believe we were all sitting there. You and I were talking. Um, it was me, you, uh, Austin Peterson. We're all in the room, and we we're. Uh, we were talking about the about libertarian theory and such, and uh, it, it probably the conversation. I think some of the information oh, yeah. about Agorism. I think it was discussed. You had had some discussions with Neil about it. I just I I just find it uh, very interesting, and actually Neil, you know, put it in very interestingly in the in the story about how I mean how far does it go to be uh, a libertarian, or you know, how far does it go? Like, can you? He, he, and he put it in the script. Like, can you really sell cocaine in the store and, and tell people, just go ahead if you want to buy it, just go ahead, it's no problem. Or where you, where uh, else would you sell cocaine? On the streets? That's absurd. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, I agree with that. It, the thing is that, that people are not that... Um, yeah, you know what? I, I do agree with it. It's just it's just strange to think that way because we we grew up in a in a society that it's not acceptable to anywhere, really. And it's just it's it's interesting. It's interesting to think about it. What would happen if people could do whatever they really want, and it's just their own responsibility. And uh, I mean, to to tell the truth, it's a very good uh, uh, example. Is for uh, I come from Israel, and in Israel, let's just say bars are open twenty four hours. Yeah. If they want to, yeah, and and which means that the government trusts the citizens that they will still go to work, even if the bar is twenty four hours open. There is a thing here in 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 L.A. in in California. The bars close at two o'clock. In my opinion, it closes because 
the government doesn't trust the citizens that will actually go home on time and have enough time to go to bed and wake up for work. And I don't agree with that. Neither do I. And I, yeah. and like, do you know what I mean? It's, and that's, and, and these are the things that I do, that I do support. And I, I understand, you know, it's, and, and I agree with, yeah, go ahead and sell everything uh, and do whatever you want. I agree with that. So but I you, believe that there are a lot of people that would take advantage of it in a bad way. So you, so I mean, are you, see, so do you like, are you a libertarian or do you kind of just see yourself as, you know, freedom loving? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not a libertarian per se, but I am definitely a freedom loving. Uh, you know, um, I see. It's 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 nice to hear. It's nice to to, to look at the you know uh, America calls itself the land of the free. When I came here from Israel, I realized that it's not really that free. Uh, it's mostly not free. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but 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 to, wait, come on! They hate us for our freedoms, don't they? I mean, but at the same, but at the same time, wait. Let me let me tell you something. I came here for a reason. You are here. I'm free to pursue what I want to do, and people will not stop me. But I'm not free to drink after two o'clock in the morning. I'm not free to, uh, you know, many many other things that are really like take away your your, your freedom. So if you if you, so if your goal hand, was to start in a 24 hour bar, oh, someone bar. would get in the way of yeah. that. What's that? So if if you wanted to start a twenty four hour club, then like someone would get in the way with that of that. It's just it's your particular aspirations as an actor aren't impeded too much. Too much. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, actually, you're right. Yeah. I mean, every one of I mean, those laws you mentioned potentially represents somebody's dream being made not possible. It means somebody's freedom to pursue what they want to do not possible. Yes, actually, I agree with you. I mean, if it was up to I mean, me, I wouldn't be doing the show. I'd be selling cocaine on the street corner. <laughs> but legally, legally, not not like I would have to today by selling it on the street corner. I mean, like from a hot dog type stand, yeah. or like you know, that's that's what I meant. That's not I mean. like the other stuff you sell on the street corner. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we can see what's going to happen in Colorado and uh, uh, with the with the weed, um, new, the new laws. We'll see what's going to happen. In, Probably nothing. Oh no 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 no! Don't don't miss don't don't, miss, don't, don't, don't like George Bush said. Don't misunderestimate me. No, don't uh, <laughs> don't underestimate the the negative impact that legalizing weed in Colorado will have. Uh, because it, I mean, it really does have some disastrous effects, especially under Obama. I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of people dying uh, on the streets as a result of marijuana legalization in Colorado, but probably more likely from drone strikes than marijuana. Oh really? Why, why do you think why do you think it's going to happen? No, well, it's no. Just, well, actually, the government is already using drones to patrol, and there are places where it's being legally contested. And, and there, we were really glad to bring on uh, a guest last week, David Swanson, who got a resolution passed in Northern Virginia, or in uh, excuse me, in Chantilly, specifically no Charlottesville, specifically banning drones in that city. But uh, the Obama administration has been using drones uh, overseas to bomb suspected terrorists and oftentimes ends up bombing innocent people. And there have been uh, about 300 children now that have died as a result of the drone strike policy that are just the confirmed kills and that. So if you're worried about the, comp uh, the, the consequences of legalized marijuana in Colorado, the government consequences are far worse than any of the free market consequences. Uh, well... Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, it's always like that. Well, uh, by the way, by um, the way. we have a little yeah. message from our director here. Uh, Adam, don't you remember that uh, bars here in Nevada are open 24 <laughs> 7? <laughs> so do. that's why Neil well, put the shoot in Nevada, huh? Well, why not? But see, but see, but see, in Nevada, they are open for a completely different reason. Which is just as much government control. Keep you gambling? Keep you, gamb Keep you do whatever you need to do in order to spend more money. Uh, I don't know if it's 100% sure, but I heard that they, in every hotel they put uh, oxygen in the, in the AC so you can't go to sleep. Um, you know, all these things that it's just exactly the same thing, just the opposite way. 
Is that true? They pump oxygen into casinos to make people. Well, I don't know, but more? the but the bars were open quite late. <laughs> where actually it was open all night at where we were at. So I mean, you know, any time of day we could. I mean, we could drink. In the United States, you can smoke inside, drink outside, uh, do whatever you want. Prostitution is, is legal. Um, you know, well, no in certain areas, areas. Whatever, and nothing. It's 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 because they wanted to spend money because the government is making a lot of money. It's just as much government control in the, in, in the opposite way. Well, well, that that's possible. I agree. I mean, is that what you want to take away from them? World that doesn't that doesn't that they don't live like that. Do you know any place that they don't they, that don't, they don't live like live they like, like them in Vegas? <laughs> I can't hear you very well. I'm, oh. We're breaking up. I'm sorry. It looks I'm like sorry. Skype is screwing up. We're getting a little little feedback on the line, but we're going to have to say thanks for joining us, Adam. Really appreciate it. Kevin? Adam, you take care now.